the thing that people need to understand is that we don't have direct elections in the United States, and the primaries play a particular role in the decision making of the two pol pol permanent political parties uh, in choosing their candidates. So it's a process that reflects the political motion of different tendencies at the base, and it's also a process that reflects the relative strength of different contenders. So usually uh, there may be a, a few contenders in each party and they sort of have a, a public tussle before they have a series of primaries in each state and the, you know, a lot of electoral power rests at the state level, not at the national level because of the complicated way our electoral system is set up to sort of dodge democracy. This year, however, uh, it became clear uh, not too far into the primary season that both the political parties were in sort of a state of crisis. And this was marked most uh, clearly by the meteoric rise in the Republican Party of Donald Trump, who is not really a politician per, per se. He's, he's a, a real estate magnate who is a, uh, whose main uh, business has been self-promotion for several decades. And then on the left, the rise of Bernie Sanders, who um, is contending for the Democratic nomination, but he's never actually been a Democrat. He's worked with Democrats in his positions as a member of the House of Representatives and as a member of the Senate but he has always run as an independent. And so he was the only independent in the Senate uh, for the last few years. Uh, and for him to take a stand of running against the sort of uh, presumed uh, candidate of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, was a bold stand to take but what was even more surprising was that he actually generated a huge amount of support. Now what makes that particularly uh, significant is that he's an open socialist and it's, you, you, in the United States you might as well say you're an open uh, member of ISIS. To say, I'm a socialist and I'm running for president, it's assumed you're either crazy or a completely marginal candidate who can be overlooked without even thinking about it. Yet, uh, Sanders has drawn enormous support uh, from surprising sectors of the society with minimal money in, at his disposal. And uh, so when we look at the, this particular primary season, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. The picture of America that both the world and Americans are presented by American mass media is mostly false. Uh, the decline in living standards, uh, s particularly since uh, the financial crash of 2008, has been precipitous. It's uh, affected what was once known as the middle class, people understand it to be something that's rapidly shrinking. I know that's not unique to the United States, but if people had any illusions that the United States was exempt from it, they should forget that. It's happening really hard, really fast, and people who for generations saw their future as one of permanent upward mobility are now faced with a sudden loss of stability that's uh, wrenching. And uh, so in some ways it's your classic situation where you see that kind of polarization, but you have to include the added aspects of the particularities of, of American society and American culture and the fact that there's always been a racial divide in, in the United States from its formation because of the, the crucial role that color played in the slave trade and, in, and the role of slavery in actually building up the country in the first place. The period where uh, uh, people are singled out for harassment both by police and white civilians for the color of their skin is with us today and in some cases it's actually getting exacerbated. Now why is that particularly happening now? Well as I said there's that kind of polarization where people who feel that their life security is under threat lash out at the people below them economically rather than the people above them economically. Uh, if they were in that precarious middle position 
that's who they who they're they're going to go after the easy targets and they're easily manipulated into that kind of racism and xenophobia. But the other factor which has to be taken into consideration is that when uh, a black man was elected president, it rocked the culture to its foundations. You can't see it overtly in, in examining American TV shows or American music, but in fact that, that happened for millions and millions of people uh, who uh, just in having to make the choice of Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton in the primary in 2008 and over John McCain in the fight uh, over the, in the presidential race forced people to take a look at where their sympathies lay uh, in light of both the history of racial division and racial uh, dominance for white people and in light of the fact that that system had been brought under hard challenge by social movements in the United States and that had resulted in some breakthroughs for, uh, for black citizens, for brown citizens, and other non-whites to come in and actually uh, take part in the power structure. Okay, so there actually was a political class formed out of the support that communities gave to uh, to political contenders and, and, then and then elected officials whose whole uh, political careers were made possible, made possible by the struggle to enfranchise people of color in the United States. That's a, that, that's a reality that had not dawned on a lot of people in the United States. And when it began to dawn on them, they had to make a choice. And the majority of the voters chose to oppose racism in the 2008 and 2012 elections, which is uh, actually extraordinary in itself. In fact, it was something that until Obama actually started to show that he had real political strength in, uh, among Democratic voters in, in 2008, it was assumed across the board that it was like the Jesse Jackson campaign, chaotic. At the same time, those, uh, th there's a similar choice that's being made by many white people that's the choice that most people of color have had to make a long time since was to s decide whether their interests lay in, s in uh, a partnership with capital and hoping that that would filter down into some kind of benefit which would result in a secure life. Well, it, again, it's, it, it's unique for a lot of different reasons, and some of those reasons aren't really even discussed in the national dialogue about the, about the election. Uh, the, the, mo what uh, most of the discussion is trying to nail down exactly how the Sanders campaign can be written off as a flash in the pan, when in fact it's extremely significant. People have to understand when they look at the history of the United States and when they talk about the question of a socialist running for president, the last time a, a, an avowed socialist ran for president and received even close to a million votes was 1912. That was Eugene Victor Debs who ran on the Socialist Party ticket in 1912, where there were, which was one year where there was actually more than two parties in contention for the presidency, but it, it was a high point in popularity for that, the socialist movement in that particular period. Now we've got a very different situation, okay? The repression against socialism has made it, uh, has demonized any form of socialism, even the, the far right-wing socialists that, uh, that supported uh, the Vietnam War. Couldn't, these, there were people who, for whatever political reason, came from the socialist uh, heritage of, that existed in the United States uh, which ranged, you know, which included uh, communists and social democrats and Trotskyists and Maoists and what have you. They all were forced into the shadows by, essentially by both government repression and a non-stop propaganda effort to demonize the left. And so when you would talk about the left just a year ago in this country, what people would think of was Hillary Clinton who basically stands to the right on a lot of positions of Richard Nixon, okay? Um, 
<laughs> Bernie has actually changed all that because he not only did he step out front and say, I'm a socialist and I'm going to run for the Democratic Party uh, nomination, but then people responded to it by saying, well, if what he's talking about is socialism, that sounds great to me. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the young people who are coming into college age or passing out of college now miss the worst of the repression of the left. They miss the worst. I mean, at this point, if you were trying to talk like J. Edgar Hoover used to talk about how there are communists under your bed and they're going to come out at night and strangle you in your sleep, that's dismissed as Silly. In fact, J. Edgar Hoover, is, who once terrorized the entire nation, is now considered kind of a figure of fun historically. Uh, he's the closest thing to a, a really powerful fascist in, in, in uh, the 20th century in the United States. The new generation, as I say, when they look back on that, it just seems like a joke. And, uh, but of course it wasn't. They weren't affected by that, but that, that means that they're they're not afraid of socialism, essentially. They're, they're ready to at least consider it. Now, what is it that Bernie says that's so appealing? Well, he, he's an experienced politician. He's worked uh, mostly in one state, a mostly white state, for decades, uh, building a, a coalition of supporters from a broad range of the population. Um, and what he stood for are basically uh, not so much socialist as anti-neoliberal demands. So he focuses on the aspects of U.S. society today which are anachronistic, uh, except for the fact that, that, run, that neoliberalism and, and uh, uh, a, a runaway uh, f free market economy has made it impossible to propose certain things which are commonplace in many other countries, such as national health insurance, such as free higher education, such as laws uh, regulating the influence of, of, uh, of huge amounts of money on the political process, which greatly undercuts democracy and grossly gives the benefit to large corporations and the super rich. He speaks directly to those issues. Okay, he, he speaks directly with proposals that are not proposals that he cooked up himself, but are the reflection of proposals that have come out of social movements over the last few decades. There has long been a movement in the United States for single-payer health insurance, uh, something along the Canadian model, which is not so radical, but compared to what even Obama was prepared to, uh, to propose through his uh, famous Obamacare package, uh, it's beyond the bounds of that. So he, he uh, uh, so when Bernie started talking about single payer, he wasn't talking in a vacuum. There had already been a movement afoot in just, I, I, I think in every state that had been talking about single payer for a long time and had actually garnered a lot of support. So it, it, that immediately resonated. Free higher education is an issue that's extremely important because, as Bernie has pointed out very, very well, the cost of student loans, which is basically the cost of tuition, which, is made, which it has put higher education out of reach for most students, so they have to apply for student loans, which are impossible to pay off in this economy, has amounted to a situation where uh, young people are punished for wanting to go to college. They actually are paying, they're paying their lives away just in order to go to college when the value of a college education in itself in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a, a leading to a secure life has been broken down quite a bit by the recession. So talking about free higher education, which as I said, is a, a simple investment in, uh, in, in public education which could be easily paid for by cuts in the military economy, by uh, transaction taxation of, of uh, financial speculators, things like that, are basically laughed off even by Hillary Clinton as being impossible to pay for because they can't even conceive of infringing on the, uh, the, the tax benefits and the, free, the, the, the freedom to 
uh, make enormous profits that, that exist for corporations, for banks, and so forth, and of course can't conceive of any kind of cuts in the absolutely ridiculous budget of the Pentagon, which is, you know, I mean, any small amount of research will show people that it's, it's, it's beyond belief. It makes, it makes Kafka look like uh, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, I mentioned before about the way that uh, the social movement for black equality and for voting rights led to the formation of a black politi political class which was much more marginal now and is now strong enough to actually put forward a candidate who wins the general election. Um, we're talking about social movements that now have been around for several decades and you can look at three key social movements and see how their role gets complicated in the current, um, in the current uh, Democratic Party race, and that would be labor, uh, the movement for uh, black freedom, and the women's movement, okay? And in each of those cases, you have a leadership layer that one way or another is tied into the political apparatus of the Democratic Party, okay? Uh, in the case of labor, that's long-standing. It goes back to the days when uh, Franklin Roosevelt actually made it possible for uh, industrial organization to take place on a mass scale, and he needed a strong working class as an ally against the right wing of capital in order to save capitalism in the 30s. When he basically gave the, uh, the green light, when he indicated that he was going to stop uh, holding back industrial organization and strikes, uh, the huge movement that resulted from that was the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which became a steadfast ally, ally of, of uh, the New Deal and the, the, the uh, Allied effort in World War II, and all basically because of their tight alliance with, with Roosevelt. And when Roosevelt died and the Democratic Party shifted to the right, that posed a crisis for the labor movement, the level of political influence that existed uh, during Roosevelt's lifetime that was undercut seriously. There was a purge of leftists from the labor movement and so on. So you have a whole history behind the close ties between the labor movement, the organized labor movement, and uh, the Democratic Party, even though the Democratic Party is neither a labor party or a social democratic party in any sense, except maybe if you're looking for an equivalent, you have to turn to the Democratic Party. But uh, the Democratic Party, like a lot of social democratic parties now, but uh, has been, but in the case of the Democratic Party, has been for a long time, is basically uh, first and foremost a, a, an ally of capital and a tool of capital in, in, in most respects. But it also relies heavily on the labor movement to, for, it, for its funding, for example. So it's a very complicated um, it's a very complicated relationship, uh, which is easily boiled down to, you know, good guys, bad guys, but that doesn't really get to the, to the, to the gist of it. But what that means in terms of this race is that um, most of organized labor is pretty solidly behind Hillary. The base is different. There actually is a movement which includes a few unions that actually supported Sanders, like the communication workers, of, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, rank and file members of the unions who, who favor, and, and, and locals of the larger, of the national unions who favor Sanders and who want to get the message across to their leadership that their vote doesn't come that cheap. Now, in the black movement, it gets even more complicated because there, in there you actually have a, a clear generation gap uh, between younger blacks who are in the same position as younger whites in regards to looking ahead to an insecure future and having to deal with the problems of, of, uh, of paying for higher education with the added additional factor of having to face every day a, uh, a, a police department locally from coast to coast uh, engaged in the kinds of pointedly racial physical attacks that used to be 
considered the work of mainly of vigilantes more than, than police. Now, in fact, police have always done this, but partly because of social media and partly because of the racist backlash against uh, the Obama's election, it's become, it's, it's become more commonplace. I'm talking about murder, torture, uh, and an incarceration rate which is staggering. So young black men are, I, I mean, I, uh, Bernie actually cites this quite a lot, the, 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 the number of, uh, of young black men who are likely to be imprisoned compared to the number of young black men who are likely to graduate college. It's stark. So why do black people in some sectors of the black community vote for Hillary? Partly it has to do with the fact that uh, there, the, the, uh, the social movements and other institutions that played a part in the social movements that helped create that political class are tied in with that political class. And that political class, so now I'm talking about black elected officials in the main, but certainly not the, uh, not an overwhelming majority, but a majority, have had to fight for their position of, and, and maintain it in the Democratic Party, and they've been able to accumulate a considerable amount of clout within the Democratic Party. How far that goes in terms of clout in relationship to the forces, of the, the neoliberal uh, business forces that are actually uh, drastically undercutting the, uh, the livelihoods of, of, of black people, working class black people from coast to coast, that's, that's a, a, a serious problem, particularly for those black people who look to that class for leadership. But they, they've worked, a lot of them have worked closely with the Clintons, including some legendary figures like John Lewis, who was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. On the one hand, the idea that, that uh, we can form a wing inside the Democratic Party that might be considered Sanders Democrats um, is very likely. It's actually something that's already happening. The idea that that wing can take over the party is a much harder thing to, uh, co to consider a possibility, at least in the short run. And in the long run, we all die anyway, so all, all we can do is wait to see what develops over the next few years. Um, but when it comes to affecting the policies and the direction of the Democratic Party, that is probably uh, the main reason why uh, Democrats are preferable to Republicans, because if you're looking for an anti-neoliberal anti party, you don't look to the Democrats. But if you're looking for a party where social movements can actually uh, have a certain amount of leverage in the direction that, that, uh, uh, that policymakers take, elected officials and, and others connected with the democratic establishment, there is leverage. You know, the issues, all the issues that, that Hillary Clinton talks about reflect the demands of social movements. And the stronger that social movements get, the more that, is, that, more that it's for, it forces the party from rhetoric to action. But it's all, you know, the question is, is that enough? And people who, on the left, who say uh, the Democratic Party is not our friend, uh, and I think they're perfectly right to say that, but they, they then go on to say any work with the Democratic Party is basically just feeding the beast, which I think is, um, makes great sense if we lived in a world of good guys and bad guys, but in terms of actual, the political situation that we're in with a, an, where the left is, has been and continues to be really isolated and small and fragmented and politically incoherent, that doesn't make any sense at all. We have to work with Democrats, not all Democrats. We have to oppose some Democrats. The, the, the right and center right wing of the party has to be opposed. Their elected officials have to be drummed out of office. The same is with Republicans, but you're going to have to work with uh, center left and left Democrats in order to get that done if you don't happen to be identified with the Democratic Party. However, uh, it, gets, it, it gets and remains complicated around the question of how much power can we actually hope to get in the Democratic Party. And uh, 
But there's a mirror question to that, which is how much power and influence can the left expect to get if it completely shuns and sets itself in opposition to the Democratic Party and to all the people that it represents who are basically people who identify with social movement demands. And uh, that's a question which actually the Bernie campaign has brought to the fore and there's, a, been a, there's always been a lot of debate but now the debate has something much more concrete to work around and I think it's actually helping to cohere the, the left, the American left politically in a way that, it, that nothing else has been able to in quite some time. Well, the potential is there and, and it hasn't been this strong in, in many years, okay? We've seen it before, we've seen it, the possibility in the Jackson campaign, but you know, again, there's complicated reasons why that couldn't come to fruition. Uh, we've seen it, um, in the attempts back in the 60s and, uh, and particularly in 1972 where uh, the peace movement and the civil rights movement were actually able to push aside the democratic establishment and push forward a, 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 their own progressive candidate in the form of George McGovern, at which point there was a united front of mainstream, of uh, establishment Democrats, Republicans, and virtually every part of the American uh, ruling class to, uh, crush McGovern, which they did. He, won, you know, he only won one state and it wasn't even his own. Um, and that was held up as an object lesson to Democrats for decades after. Don't, you know, don't even think about somebody as far left as, uh, well, let alone Bernie Sanders, as far left as, as Elizabeth Warren because that's going to scare away the voters who want a right-wing government. Uh, I don't think that was ever really true, but uh, it, it brought about the uh, steady drift from the center left to the center right, and in some cases all the way to the right for leading Democrats. So what's the possibility today? As I say, the potential is definitely there, and there's, um, there are efforts being made uh, both in the Bernie campaign, which is essentially a political campaign that is caught fire largely through the internet um, and social movements that have been active for a long time and including some newer social movements that have that are that uh, are coming from uh, mainly from young workers students uh, and um, just young people who who uh, are have come to the point where they can recognize injustices that they want to organize against, okay? There's a distance between political movements and social movements. Social movements often are more uh, broadly based and uh, speak directly to particular constituencies. Political movements are, are, have a more general diffusion in the population and are usually uh, centered around candidates and election times. But they have a common, in, in this case they actually have a, a very important common goal and they each have something to teach the other. There's a big schism between them but if that schism can be breached and in particular if, if the Bernie campaign can recognize and reach out to social movements and start to learn about the work that's being done and the people who are involved in that work and start to share their political experience then I think you have the basis for a, a a new social and political force in the United States which could eventually become a serious national opposition. But it's not going to happen by magic, it's not going to happen strictly by, by uh, computer clicks or by calling a meeting and then declaring a, you know, a new coalition. That, that, that you know, that's, gets done like several times a year by various different organizers and you know, that's not what's going to do it. It's going to have to be for lack of a better word, a knitting together, a careful knitting together of people who are, you know, uh, practically one-on-one -on -one breaking through the little uh, bubbles that the fragments of the left have built around themselves and start to recognize that if we can get together, we do hold uh, the prospect of having the kind of, uh, of fundamental transformation that, that everybody uh, on, the, on the ground envisions. Um, Starting, starting that process in our lifetime rather than having to wait for the next generation or the next or the next.